Hello, I'm Lauren Dabbitt with UNICEF USA, and this is another installment of Ask the Expert. Today, we're joined by Mark Connolly, the UNICEF representative in Honduras. Mark, thanks so much for being here today, and let's dive right in. So what does COVID-19 response look like in Honduras, and how, what are the challenges involved in protecting families right now? Well, the challenge here in Honduras really is from a epidemiological point of view, we're kind of flying blind. There's very low level of testing for COVID-19. Um, it's just gone up to a few hundred tests per day, but even our total numbers are just barely over 6,000, which means we, we really don't know. And then when you find out who's being tested, it's mostly people accessing the health system to die with very, very strong symptoms. So we're in a situation where we don't know the big picture, but there's a lot of fear because there's very high death rates. And that I think is the biggest challenge on a, on a good side. You know, we've been in full lockdown for over 60 days. So even without the epidemiological intelligence, the government was prudent enough to see what was happening elsewhere and put in some rather severe measures. But I think that uh, can only last for so long. So one thing that we've seen in response efforts around the globe is the importance of communicating accurate information. So how are you in UNICEF Honduras communicating information to children and families about the pandemic? And then how are you using kids in that effort as well? That's a, a great question. And that's probably the most exciting thing that we're doing right now, because as we all know, there's also just a huge outbreak of misinformation. And in this region, Latin America, Caribbean, we have found that what UNICEF produces and puts out there in regular media, social media, and everything else tends to be the go-to source, partially because it's not quite as technical as World Health Organization or US CDC, but also because it's with local people conveying the messages. One of the big breakthroughs that we've had that we didn't foresee, but it's one of these great positive lessons learned in times of COVID, is we found that the private sector here, whether it's the, the coffee producers or the shopping malls that are all closed, the big retailers, they also want their staff and clients to have access to reliable, clear, visually attractive messaging. So they all come to UNICEF for that one too. And we find ourselves probably the most recognized brand in the country for reliable material about COVID. When it comes to young people and involving them, we are one of the countries in the region that has what we call U Report. And this was set up long before COVID. It's basically via telephone, young people being reporters about what's going on in their communities and what they care about. And your report is backed up worldwide with a whole uh, survey apparatus. So you can do five questions and in real time, see what people are doing, see what people are thinking, see what people are believing. And that's kind of like taking the pulse of public opinion, but it's, it's led by young people. So we have been very successful in our young you reporters sharing all sorts of materials and cranking up debates and discussions on hot topics. That's wonderful to hear. So one of the things that we often highlight on our end are the many reasons that children and families are forced to migrate, uh, particularly because of violence and poverty. So how does the pandemic sort of interplay with those factors? Are there families that are still migrating during all of this? It's very, very complex, and it's playing out in ways that, uh, that aren't so good. On the last question, there's a, there's a marked decrease of people migrating and leaving the country. But the push factors for migration haven't changed radically. Obviously, poverty getting worse in times of COVID and violence. In some countries, we're seeing big drops in homicide rates and, and violence. But unfortunately, Honduras isn't one of those countries. So we're seeing a lot, well, I won't say more, but just with the instability, increased violence. So while families affected by violence are migrating less, that doesn't mean they're staying at home. They're displaced. They go to another community 
where uncles or aunts or relatives are. So they're move, moving around still to, to flee violence, just not crossing the borders. But we also here in Honduras have a very confounding variable, which we weren't expecting, uh, which is increased numbers of deportations of children and families from the United States and from Mexico. So the planes that land full of returning migrants present UNICEF with a huge challenge because due to the public health norms, you know, those folks need a 14 day quarantine and very few communities want to take people who've been deported from the US or Mexico back in their communities. So we, UNICEF, we've been scrambling to set up 14 day quarantine centers with cooperation from civil society and church groups who have facilities. And then our job with the government is to make them uh, up to public health standards for quarantine. But the, the big confounding problem on that one is, let's say a plane arrives today and we have 17 kids and we get them into the quarantine facility. If a plane arrives in two days with another 22 kids, we, we can't put them in that same facility. So every, every single week, we have to scramble to get quarantine facilities set up for return migrants. And then, of course, once the 14 days are up, where do they go? You know, and what we're also finding is we have to be very discreet on getting them back into communities because of the the stigma and the discrimination. No one, no one wants them if they find out that they were on a flight, a deportation flight coming from somewhere north of here. So it's very, very complicated, but, uh, but we're getting it done. I think it highlights the flexibility of your team, you know, and able to sort of hustle and make this work for the young people who need it. That's really, really impressive. The other thing I want to ask you about um, is education. Are children in Honduras adapting to distance learning? Um, what about after school programs and activities? How are you helping kids stay engaged and stay learning during this time? This is a, a big area, a big concern, and we've been putting a lot of activity into it. And it's, it's an example, and I'm not being cynical here, but it's an example of how every community, every town, every state, every country has to know what's going on in its reality before coming up with some of the solutions. The vast majority of Honduran kids don't have daily internet access. The vast majority of school going children don't have that sort of internet access. When we saw that the connectedness was a challenge, we reached out to the, the national television channels and the two private sector telecoms companies and basically said, UNICEF and others, we can get the content up there, but what we need is regular television to have dedicated hours per day, four to seven hours per day for educational learning, pretty much during school hours. So again, the, the head of household can basically say, it's school time now and put on, put on the TV. And our job was then to get the content in there, whether it's Sesame Street in Spanish coming out of Mexico or other things that Viacom produces. And the whole purpose there wasn't really structured online learning, but the whole purpose was to keep in everyone's head that there are school hours, that there's a certain amount of time per day where education should be filling some of the space and filling some of the gaps. And we are, of course, working with the Ministry of Education for all the exciting online stuff that we could grow into. But, uh, you know, a lot of people, I also think, forget that uh, all the online stuff has a price tag, too. And, you know, for low income and poor families, uh, they don't have that extra money lying around even to pay their phone bills. So we're, we're sticking with national TV for the time being as the major intervention. Well, thank you so much for sharing and thank you for being with us today. Be safe and send our best to the rest of the team in Honduras. And to well, our thank you all for reaching out. It's very, very comforting to have pleasant Zoom calls like this, which are interactive and a chance to share ideas. Thank you.
Wonderful. We'll take it. And to our viewers, stay tuned for the next installment next week.